With over a million copies sold, Mark Nepo has moved and inspired readers and seekers all over the world with his number one New York Times bestseller, The Book of Awakening. Beloved as a poet, teacher, and storyteller, Mark has been called one of the finest spiritual guides of our time, a consummate storyteller and eloquent spiritual teacher. His work is widely accessible and used by many, and his books have been translated into more than 20 languages. A best-selling author, he has published 22 books and recorded 15 audio projects. Today, my guest is inspiring mind, Mark Nepo. Oh, well, th thank you so much. It's great, great to be with you. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So I, uh, I, I read your, one of your, uh, on, on your web, web page, you said it was the Charles Dickens. It was the best of years or best of times, and it was the worst of times. And I, I'm trying to find in, in myself, after listening to many spiritual people say that it was, it's, it's actually good for our soul. Maybe you could just elaborate on how these times were good for us. Well, let, yeah, so let me back up and talk a little bit about, about uh, the times we're in. As, and again, you know, as we're all just talking, everything we, we talk about is just a guess, <laughs> you know. Um, when I share, I, I don't have, I, I offer examples, not instructions, you know. Right, right. And, um, but I think that, you know, from my work that I'm long-term cancer survivor, 35 years ago, I was in my mid thirties and almost died from a rare form of lymphoma. And interestingly, when all of the pandemic started happening, um, I was very struck it, it it was bringing stuff up, you know, not just because it was, a, a, you know, an illness, but the way that it all came to the world, which I think, you know, I want to share this speaks to um, what it's throwing us all into. And, you know, years ago, when I first got diagnosed, I went, I had a huge tumor on my skull. And I went to a doctor and uh, went to an appointment. And, you know, life changed. Like when that appointment was over, when I went to leave that building, the door I had come through to keep that appointment was gone. There was no way back to life before that appointment. Right. And I feel like what the pandemic has done when it showed up over a year ago, it did that to the entire uh, humanity. The old world's gone. Right. There's no going back. And, and so, you know, one of the difficult things about that is it engenders loss and grief. And you can see that, you know, I've, I don't know if you've run, ever run across uh, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's work. She, she was, uh, yeah. And, you know, she was the, the mother of the modern hospice movement and, um, and in the seventies, and she noticed that there were these stages of grief not sequential, but stages of grief that people bounce around in when they experience deep loss. And they are denial, anger, bartering, depression, and acceptance. And if you look at our society, I mean, I know when the pandemic first hit, I went through a bunch of those, you know, I'm yeah. a teacher, I go all over and and yeah, you know, I haven't traveled in over a year, you know. Um, but when you look at our society, there are whole pockets still of our society that are stuck in these phases. There's a whole pocket of our of our country that's stuck in denial. Oh, there's no pandemic. No, it's not. You know what? How can you say? <laughs> how can that be? Look at all the people who are suffering. Look at what's happening. There's a whole group of of our society that are stuck in anger. Right. Would you would you say that this particular situation has brought people to to their original wound? Yeah, I think that's a good way of saying it. Sure, it, it touches that, brings it up, and then you know. But we are all challenged. We're all challenged to face what life brings us, you know, because every person is given a chance to be dropped into the depth of life. And that's where the journey begins. And it doesn't always have to be difficult things that open us, it can be wonderful things. But right now, I think that the world has been thrown into like a global Sabbath. 
you know, the word Sabbath in Jewish tradition means literally one day we don't turn one thing into another. You just stop, stop, you know, you don't manipulate it, you don't bend it, you don't reframe it, you know, you know, right. and, and the whole world has been forced in this last year to stop, to stop. And that, that that's a challenge in itself. But, but I know from what I went through all those years ago, that what, what opens us is never as important as what is opened in us. Right. Like a tornado can come through and clear a field, but it's, it's the field that's clear that what's what matters, right. not the tornado. And so what, what is being opened in us? You know, you look at what's happened in, you know, just yesterday with the convictions of Derek Chauvin and all of what happened last summer with George Floyd. And, you know, I think that though, you know, the, one of the reasons so many people around the world were able to protest and stand up and speak unlike any other time is that this pandemic has broken a large part of humanity open. Yeah. And so people, it wasn't, it wasn't just an idea. Right, right. No, this was real. People were feeling it. All of us were feeling it. Um, and, you know, that, so, so I think that, you know, we're being asked to move forward and we need each other to move forward. So, you know, are these times good for us or bad for us? Well, I'd rather say that um, they're real and we have the chance to be authentic with each other, which every generation has. I, I, I kind of find that for, for me personally, that as I try to progress on the spiritual wheel, or I, I know it's not a linear uh, pathway, um, and I know that I've gone around in circles and it's kind of brought me back to the initial place that I began. Uh, and in that place of beginning for me, it's almost made me depressed because I, th not that I didn't think I progressed, but it's brought me to question things and to actually have more um, insight into my own development and what to trust and what not to trust, as I said earlier. And yeah. In, in, terms of, in terms of your life itself, from, from a person from your perspective, having the insight that you do in the poetic mind, how did, what, what insight do you gain from this experience from this, this time, these times? Well, I, I think that, you know, it leads me into a place of, of opening the heart even deeper. So, you know, as I get, as I get older, um, I find I feel more than one thing at the same time. Like when we're young, we're kind of taught, you know, you feel, oh, oh, you're sad, cheer up. Right, right. Like when has that ever worked, right? You know, <laughs> right? it just makes you feel more alone. Right. But I can actually feel, you know, sad and happy at the same time, clear and confused at the same time. So what I've been, been moved to is that there's a depth experience, the deep, the more real we are, the deeper we go and the deeper we go, the more we, the more we truly feel each other. And, and so I feel like, you know, every, every generation has a chance to be cruel or kind. And, um, and I think things like this allow us to really show up for each other you know, to drop the pretense and drop posturing and just help each other. Yeah. And so, you. yeah. And so I find, and, and I would also say, like you were saying, like one of the things like, you know, often I know in my life, it might seem like I'm circling, but it's more like a spiral. It's covering the same ground, but it keeps going. Correct. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah, that's a difference. That's a difference because we're we're always, um, you know, it's like in, I, my parents are now gone. I had, had a real difficult, never really, my mother and I never really kind of got, were connected in a really clear, good way. And so, you know, I've worked for years on that relationship. 
Right. So, you know, it's still, even while she's gone, it still comes back. And, and I say, you know, and at first when I, I'm always surprised, I shouldn't be. And then I go, I, I don't need to work on this. I, I don't want this anymore. I'm tired of this. Right. Yeah, but it's not done with me. I understand. It's not done with me. And it's asking me, yeah, but you got to look at this in another way. You got to look at this. Yeah, so you're, it looks like you're circling, but you're actually spiraling, continuing. And, you know, one of the reasons I've learned about, you know, often people, especially older people, uh, you know, tend to repeat themselves and tell stories and over and over. And, but it's not just, I, I've come to feel it's not just about because of lack of memory or forgetting things. I find that we tell stories more than once or we're visited by stories more than once because there's too much to digest in one telling. That makes sense. And so it, it comes back. It comes back and say, no, I got more for you. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. Um, for myself, I, I put together a documentary film about my relatives from Russia during World oh, War II. Oh, wow. And in the process of doing such, um, having had readings from past life experiences and such, it all tied in together of the present life that I'm leading. And each, each, each bud opening itself up almost to the experience of recall and reminding me of what I experienced and where I came from. Uh, and for me, it was kind of life altering because it threw me back out of this world, I felt somewhat and brought me back to another time and another place. Um, so it, you know, when, when this, the pandemic hit itself now, as we, as we're discussing, uh, just to leeway into the, to the, to the peop, most people are very paranoid of being in the company of other people. With that said, I don't see, I'm, I'm finding it difficult for people to be able to actually get close to people, more so they're actually distancing themselves. So I, I guess it's more of, maybe you can elaborate on something to that effect because- Well, I think there's a paradox here because while we're physically distancing, yeah, we actually are, our hearts are opening. And again, we have that choice, just like some people are denying and some people are angry and some people are running from it. Yeah, well, I understand that. That's real. But then we, we got to, you know, fear is something to be moved through, not obeyed. Oh, that's great. You know, and so if we don't, if we obey it, then we don't get past that. And, and if we can move through it, then even when we're physically distanced, our heart, as long as our heart is open, we, we get actually closer to each other. We get closer to people. I know my, you know, my family came from Russia too. Um, and uh, my grandmother, who I, I mentioned on my father's side, I was really close to her. And she, she uh, lived to be 94. And uh, she grew up in, um, she was born outside of Kiev. In a, I don't think it's there anymore. A little village farm, then you know, it's, like, it's not farmland anymore. It's just right, you know, right. like New York, right? But it was a little town, Katerinoslav, and um, but you know, my grandmother was uh, uh, a real presence in my life, and um, and I, you know, I I I talk about her in terms of immigrant wisdom. Mm, same here. And in fact, that's interesting because when I had issues with my parents, my grandmother lived about a block away from me. And what I would do is just run to her house. And I, as you say, infinite wisdom, I would sit there. She would break open the food first to, to initiate me. And then out came the photo albums of her whole background in, in Russia and her whole, her whole story. So I was six or seven years old. And from there, everything just folded into its own, as you said, wisdom. That infinite ancestral wisdom just penetrated me threw me back in time thinking that here I am a seven-year-old in the streets of Brooklyn and now here I am back in Russia somehow yeah well and there's a good example when we open our heart we connect but I think it's through our heart you know when we we can jump into our mind and we can conceptualize but that's not the same thing as when I'm in my heart then I can feel 
If I feel what I'm feeling to the depth that I can, then I'm open to all of that feel. That's what feeling. That's why, like, if I, if you or I feel a moment of love, if it's true enough, we're feeling the, what what all love is about. And if we open our hearts in compassion and we feel a moment of pain, we're we're feeling what the ocean of pain is all about. How do you, how, how would you suggest I could, I can use myself as, as an example, after listening to many of your interviews, I recognize how my heart was closed. Ah. And, and the wisdom that you uh, exude was, was teasing me with opening it and trusting your, your wisdom and your poetry. And so I said to myself, here I am in this position in a place of almost in emotional withdrawal. And I'm looking for somebody to almost drag me or pull me out of the, the, the depths of my own pain personally. And how would you, how do you, how would you speak to the, to the audience and to in general have opening your heart in these times? What's, what's the steps? Well, and again, I can just share some notes or examples and not a how to or instructions. Okay, yeah. All right, it's, okay. it's different for everybody, but I think that, you know, it, it, it really comes down to, um, for me, because everybody experiences fear. There's no getting rid of fear. You know, um, we, we can right size it, but there's no getting rid of fear. And fear has a proper place. It alerts us to true danger. But we don't, again, we don't obey it. So there's always, when we're feeling closed, when we're feeling afraid, that's when we have to try to be quietly courageous. And how do we do that? Well, you know, all these traditions talk about breathing. You just start by opening your breath. We start by holding nothing back, giving our full attention to whatever is before us. I don't care what it is. Could be a glass, could be the tree outside my window, but giving our full heart's attention to whatever is before us until it becomes our teacher. Everything has something to teach us. And only when we open, so we start, I, you know, I always feel like we start by by little step. You know, Mother Teresa said courage was doing small things with love. Okay. You know, you start by, and I ha I have a a friend who's a he's an amazing uh, peacemaker. You know, he works with governments and does an amazing guy. And he has this little saying of his. He said, you know, don't ask the mountain to move. Take a pebble each time you visit. Take a Isn't little piece of it. Yeah, yeah, excellent. Yeah, a step at a time, a step at a time. And and so this is a this is also I'll share. This is a custom uh, that is actually comes uh, uh, from Brazil in in the in the, the native people, not not you know the ancient people there, and it's known as uh, there's a Portuguese word because they speak port. It's like kind of Portuguese there. Uh, it's called A D I E, E D A I, and what it means is, and so, and so what they do. This is an I love these things. This is an ancient, an ancient like you said. Well, how do you start? Well, if you have a problem, you have something that's big that's happened in your life, then you go to an elder or a family member or a friend, and the custom is this: you sit down, and I would, you would say to me, you would tell me what happened. Right. And I would just listen. And then I would say, a die. And so, and the first saying of that is offered in a big, big, big way, like, okay, and so in the, in the perspective of your whole life, in this perspective of all life, right? What is not to minimize it, but okay, what does this mean? This happened to you. It was painful. It was scary, whatever it might be. So what does this mean in the context of all life? And then you would speak from your heart as to whatever that stirred in you. And I would just listen. Right. And then I would say, when you were done a second time, a die and so, and that time it's offered as, okay, 
that's what happened to you of all the space that's around you, where is the next space of solid ground? Yeah. Look around you. And so what's the next space of solid ground? And you would look around and go, well, it, you know, if it's relational, well, it's not safe to go here. It's, well, I can go to my grandmother's. That's solid ground. That's interesting. There's one more. Go ahead. So then you would, you would talk about that. And then I, one final time, I would say, a die, and so, and the last one is, and so, what's your next step? So that, that's a, that, you know, that's an anonymous wisdom that's come down through these people in South America that are taught. That's, that's fantastic. Yeah, it's fantastic. So, and so what, what is, what does this mean in the context of all of life? Wow, wow. Then, and so what, where's, where's the next step of solid ground that's nearest you? And then what's your next step? Well, it, listening to what you're saying is like like a mother figure, almost supporting supporting a, like a false ego, an ego built on pain, and looking for self centeredness and like a narcissistic archetype, and and in fact, using that actually eased my mind. Just hearing that, it actually minimized the the self centeredness of what a person would focus in on. So I actually felt that. And, and, and it's interesting, I, as, I, as, I, as I listen to your wisdom and your poetry um, and, the, and the insight that you have, uh, it, it teaches us that um, the, the ego needs to be slightly or petted in order for it, the soul to just rise. And now in, in, in innate... Well, yeah, well, often, strength, let, let, let's talk for a moment about, about self and ego. You know, because there's, there's, and, and let me use the image of, of the ocean and a boat, because all the self is like, you know, we're, we, we, we each carry a portion of universal spirit. We call it, in the West, we call it the soul. In the East, they call it Dharma nature or Atman. There's a thousand names, right? But we carry this thing in us, this spirit. Well, you can't, but it's in a body, right? You, you can't be here. You need something to hold it, to walk in the world. And what a self is, it's like, you know, you could swim, you could try to swim across the ocean, but you're not going to really make it. <laughs> you, every, per, every spirit, every soul needs a boat to cross the ocean of life. That boat is the self. You, 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 it could be an ocean liner, it could be a broken rowboat, it could be have a glass bottom, it could, you know, there's a thousand kinds of boats, but everybody, every soul needs a vessel to carry it across life. So what, so that's the purpose of a self. It's not, it's a, it's a carrier of spirit through the world. Yeah. So the well, first question is, you know, can, can I be a good steward of the spirit I've been asked to carry while I'm here? Okay. But secondly, so what's the purpose of the ego? Well, the ego is every boat has a steering wheel. That's the, I think the true purpose of an ego, it's to steer. When we get, one of the ways we get into problems is when we, you don't ask the steering wheel where to go. You tell the steering wheel where to go. Right, right, right. You, ask your, you ask your soul, you ask your heart, you ask life for direction, okay? So we get in trouble when we turn to the ego and say, tell me what to do. And the ego says, well, I thought you'd never ask. <laughs> so, you know, when, when we misuse, but everybody has to have a steering wheel. Right. But again, it has to be right-sized and in its place and not have our identity be in there. Then 
You know, if we don't have a connection to our soul or our spirit, then we make we make the ego big. Right. All right, let's let's retrace a little bit from the present moment, a little bit back into your personal life so that we can have a better understanding of where you came from and what what uh, motivated you or what what lit the fire under your soul, so to speak. So in terms of um, reading about your personal illnesses, um, as well as when people suffer from certain types of loss or tragedy, that's usually the impetus that sets the, the, the opening, as you said, or the shedding of the soul. Um, so maybe you can just fill in a little bit of fill the, 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 the backtrack of what took place prior to your personal illness of what were life, well, what, what life was like. Yeah. Well, you know, I was, um, you know, from an early age before, I, I mean, I always, uh, before I had language for it, I think as even as a little child, the world kind of has always spoken to me in metaphor. I didn't even know what that was. And, and, you know, as I, and I come from a family of teachers and, and I think that's that part of my family heritage. I've always, I've always connected with, I, I'm a lifelong teacher. And so I wanted to be a teacher, but I, you know, I knew I was a poet and I wanted to, you know, write and teach. And so I was in, you know, uh, I was, I had gotten my doctorate at SUNY Albany upstate in Albany. I was living in Albany and I was teaching there and and, and, you know, I was feeling like, gee, if I, in, in a good way, you know, a sincere way, like if maybe if I work hard enough, maybe, maybe I might someday write one or two great poems, you know, and maybe I, you know, someone, I, someone would th really think I was a poet, you know. Well, then all of a sudden, uh, and, and before my cancer experience, I was a very driven young artist, you know, and, um, and then, that came along and it threw me upside down, inside out. Forget writing great poems. I needed to discover true poems that would help me live. Mm. Everything changed. Everything changed. Forget achieving anything. I just wanted to be here. Right, right. I just wanted to stay here. And then suddenly, you know, my and also during that time you know before that experience um oh you know i i'd had heartache and i you know broken a finger or that but i'd never been through anything that serious right. so i really so all of a sudden i was i was thrown into big time fear and pain you know pain like i'd never known uh fear like I had never known. I was terrified of everything. And I had to go, because what I had was a rare form of lymphoma, right. I had to go through all kinds of tests and procedures and open biopsies and things where they, I had to be awake in case they needed to give me general anesthetic. And so, you know, it was like, um, it was like my initiation. Mm. And so, you know, one of the first things I learned was um not through any wisdom on my part but i exhausted my heart i i couldn't keep up being afraid of everything so you know hippocrates who the greek physician who is the hippocratic oath is came from him but one of the things he said was that uh uh pleasure is the absence of pain right right and peace is the absence of fear. And so I, you know, I couldn't keep it up. Like every time a, I, a doctor would come in the room or a nurse, I'd be, you know, before they even did anything, I would be on a scale of one to 10, I'd be 14. Right, right, right. And so finally, I, you know, I just had to say, you know, I have to make discernments. I, I have to start saying, so if somebody is going to give me a take, take blood, Oh, well, I don't like, I don't want it. I don't like it. But is it really a 14? No, maybe it's a four. So it's not pleasant, but I can get through it. So I had to start making discernments about 
what's what because we tend as human beings both in good ways and bad difficult ways we tend to inflate or deflate right our experience and who we are and one of the great ongoing uh practices that comes from the buddhist worldview is the practice of seeing things as they are how do we come back and see things as they are because then we have real choices once i could start right sizing it then i said oh okay this is a four i need to bring i need to match that in order to get through it i don't need to have it be a 14 alarm fire all the time right because it exhausts me it doesn't help me it exhausts me so you know so moving through all that one of you know on the other side of my my cancer journey uh, two um, kind of big things happened to me and one was um that you know i was raised jewish i feel a great tie to the jewish heritage i always have um but i became a student of all paths because all those years ago and even still now I was not, and it's still not wise enough. You know, I'm basically here because of an unexplained miracle. And I was not, and I'm still not wise enough to know what worked and what didn't. Right, right. So I always felt like I was challenged to believe in everything. Hmm. And all my, and so I have ever since then, you know, all my books, all my teaching, all my work, I feel committed to reveal a common center of all paths, to lift up the unique gifts of each. And the cancer survivor in me is like, hey, Dai, what's your next step? How are we yeah. gonna make yeah. use of this? So, so that made me a student of all paths. And the other thing that happened to me on the other side, and again, not through any wisdom on my part, was that Everything dropped from my head into my heart, like snow melting in the ground. And ever since then, my mind has served my heart and not the other way around. Is is that when the fear dissipated or it lessened? How did that how did that transformation take place from your your heart, your head to your heart? Well, I don't I'm not really sure I can pinpoint a moment or how, but it is, I learned later, because in, the, in the, the Lakota Native American tradition, there's a powerful saying. I'm sure, I, I'm sure I've put it in one of my books. It says, the longest journey you will make in your life is from your head to your heart. Wow. The longest journey you will make in your life is from your head to your heart. And, and not because we're stupid, not because we're, because it takes time. Well, it it takes, yeah, it took time, but it also took you to go through um, an opening, a deep opening. Yeah. And, 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 and as we speak about the first uh, diagnosis, what was the difference between the first diagnosis and the second diagnosis in terms of your reaction or your... Oh, my God. Well, so the first, and for people, you know, who are listening, you know, my first diagnosis, like I said, I had a tumor on my, in my skull bone that was the size of a grapefruit pressing on my brain. Um, and that was a miracle that was that vanished. Um, and then eight or nine months later, there, that was so dramatic that a sister tumor was growing on my rib in my back. And so I was, you know, after the, the tumor in my brain disappeared, I was thrown spit like Jonah out of the mouth of the whale back into life, but you know, back into life, like, okay, who am I now? like what do i what do i do now everything's changed and and then eight or nine months later uh-oh uh-oh it's growing i can feel a lump in my back and that there was you know that the miracle you know this is another thing that i learned miracle is a process not an event so that that i had to go i had to go and have a thoracic surgeon remove that rib and the adjacent muscles and then I had to go through four months of very, very strong chemo that almost killed me until I stopped that. 
And then I was thrown back in life. So the difference for me was in the first go around. Yeah. I wasn't afraid of dying. I hadn't been through anything like this. I was scared of what I would have to go through to live. I was like, how am I going to get through this? Everything I have, they're asking me to go through terrifies me. How am I going to get through this? And then, but then when, when I got through it and then all, and then after all of that, and then another that comes around again, that's when I was in despair. That's when I thought like, I don't need another wake up call. I'm awake. I'm here. Uh, and then I was afraid I might die. Then I didn't know, you know, because I, I, all the things that I, you know, that seemed to work the first time, I tried to do them again. No, they didn't, nothing happened. And right. then I had to go to a surgeon to say, help me, take this out of me. And, um, and then, you know, I would say, so, so to go back to, you know, wanting the first write great poems and then wanting to discover true poems that would help me live. Well, so now all these years later, I want to be the poem. Mm. And, and one of the things that happened on the other side of that, which opened me in a whole other way was well, I woke up on the other side of both of those uh, experiences and I'd lost my drive, my, I, you know, and it was very disorienting. I thought, well, I'm, I'm so grateful to be here, but where's my gift? What happened? And it didn't really disappear. It changed. So I went from being driven to being drawn to things. And the best way I can explain that is through a metaphor. It's like a river, a fast moving river, like the Mississippi River. Right. It, it makes a lot of noise. You know it's a strong river. You can hear it rushing on the banks. But when it gets to the Gulf of Mexico. Calms down. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, disappear. It joins the deeper ocean. And so it makes less noise. So that's what happened to me. And I had to get used to the fact that my gift was there, but it just, it wasn't as loud. It wasn't making as much noise. And in fact, I was drawn to things and not driven anymore. And that, that enabled me uh, to be to, for a much joyous process and to be prolific. Yeah. It's interesting, um, this, the going through some type of physical setback was a blow to ego, I assume. Um, I, I know from, from personal experience, um, it's not so much the, as you said, the fear of dying, but more so the fear of suffering on the, in the process or actually judging ourselves in some capacity as weak and not being able to handle what we go through. Um, so when it's final, it's final. You, there's no longer that need to actually feel that testing of the ego. And as I, as I listen to you speak, I, 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 I think about the, the inner strength and the uh, adversity. And here we go again to really break down the ego. And to well, and we see that to bring it back for a moment to where we are today in the pandemic, we're seeing all of this everywhere. We're seeing, you know, I think we're seeing the struggles, the resistance is people that don't want to accept uh, that they're not in control. And the truth is all the traditions, spiritual traditions really say this in different ways. We've never been in control. <laughs> We've never been in control. At, at best, we're like, you know, we're like a fish that finds the current and catches the current. And now the current takes us. So when the, when the fish catches the current, it, it's an obsolete question to say, well, how much of it is the strength of the current or the strength of the fish? Right. You can't tell. You can't. And that's the real purpose of will is to catch the current of life. We, you know, we, yeah. we go down many mistaken paths throughout history, thinking that we, you know, we bend the river, you know. Right, we, right. Yeah, no, no. We're just little fish trying to catch the current. I, I wonder, I wonder if, if a lot of people always, uh, I don't know how you can, how, how we can look at this, but many people who go through setbacks, deep setbacks as, as yourself, 
a lot of people would say, would you do it anything differently? And I'm sure to your uh, testament, what would you say to that? No, I, I wouldn't. I, you know, I, I wouldn't. Um, I think because I think, you know, all the things that that we all we all have an initiation into life. And so um, and we all need to be broken open. So so if, you know, anything that I would try to change, I needed though I needed that breakdown to become who I am. I need it, you know, and the way to think about that, it's not, it's, you know, for me is, and I probably wouldn't have, wouldn't have this view if I hadn't been through all this, but what erosion is to nature is what suffering is for human beings. Mm, that's insightful. Mm. Right, nature, you know, beauty, you know, right, you know, things are eroded, mountains, you know, like I can remember uh, I went to Barbados once and on the north shore of that island are these amazing cliffs. They're called the hollows. It's amazing. The, the ocean, the, the Atlantic and the Caribbean meet there. And for a thousand years, they've, they've worn these amazing holes in, in the whole face of all the cliffs. That's an, ex that's an eroded, excellent point. They've been eroded to their beauty. Yeah, yeah. Right, but yet, the, but yet the person who's in pain and does and denies their pain doesn't reveal their own beauty. Well, and so the thing is, okay, the thing is, let's stick with this for a minute. So, um, you know, we don't know if rocks suffer, but you know, we save up, we spend money, we go to the Caribbean to see this beautiful thing, and those cliffs could be saying, "Beautiful, do you know? I'm I've been pounded the hell out of me for a thousand years." That's true. So, but so we get pounded. And so this is where I think that life, life has been made just difficult enough that we need each other because we need to hold each other up to that pounding so we can reveal our inner beauty. So this leads me to another, another metaphor about suffering that, and that is of a, of a flute, not, not a flute that's made by a music company but the original flutes, and just think, and I, I you know, I, I did some research on this when I came upon this, but flutes that were carved by hand, so, pre, you know, prehistoric people, the first flutes were like 70,000 years ago in Northern Europe. They were made out of mammoth bone, mammoths. They don't even exist anymore, right? And they would carve holes in there. I would love to talk to, to, that, to that person. Like, you know, life was so hard Right. What made them stop and carve holes by hand in a mammoth bone so that a song could come through, right? So, but the metaphor is that no two flutes were the same. And so no two flutes had the same song. And so every soul on earth is like those handmade flutes. Experience, like it or not, carves holes in us so that spirit can then come through and release our song mm, that's excellent but yet and so but, but yet we don't find we, we 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 dissolve the uniqueness in our own selves and our own our own beauty and think it's better on the grass is greener on the other side yeah and, and you know so it's not i'm not advocating suffering yeah, I'm just reporting like like gravity happens, like this is part of life. So we don't have to look for holes to be carved in us. We'll get we'll all get our share. <laughs> right, right. We'll all get our share. But but to to give into when it when you recognize that that's happening is the worst position to be in is to be carved, but not all the way through. Because your song never comes out. Does, 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 has your career offered you or given you the, the satisfaction that you initially thought it would? Or does your personal soul as a seeker keep you always seeking? And Oh, my, my you know, and, and let me say that my career, I always say now that the soul's awakening is our career. Well, that's excellent. Where that happens is our occupation. That can change. Right. So I have feel blessed that 
I, you know, what's happened to me on my path is more than I could have ever imagined. I ever imagined I'm, you know, and I, I'm, I'm thrilled just to be, uh, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't have any bucket list. I don't have any five-year plan. I'm in the middle of the stream and I just want to keep swimming there. What was, what was the point in your life where you reached that pinnacle or felt you've made it or you've, you've, de you've reached some inner satisfaction? Well, I think that, um, you know, I, I'd say that that's been in the last 10 years or so, 15. I mean, I think I was thrown in that direction on the other side of the cancer journey. Right. That any sense of, of a path of typical career or ambition or, you know, that was gone. So then it was took time to become oriented to, well, well, then what is it that matters? And so I think ever since then, I've been inhabiting uh, life where it is. And that's why, you know, like the Book of Awakening, the subtitle is having the life you want by being present to the life you have. And that, that, that's, that, what that subtitle suggests is how you start to move from your head to your heart. By being, by, by have, being present to the life you have. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I look, for example, you know, we all have dreams and desires. And sometimes we wish the desires or the dreams to come at the pace that we desire them to come at. And also, as you said, the occupation is the tool or the means for the soul to speak. Um, in terms of what we want and what life has planned for us is sometimes two different things. As you said, as a poet, you wanted to be a poet, but yet it turned out that you would, were an author, I guess, also writing and speaking and also, you know, speaking about your poems. But how did, how did, how did you hold on? And what, and was, did, did it require a lot of patience within yourself to say, it should happen now, but it's not happening? Um, no, I think, I think that, you know, almost dying in my thirties kind of just blew that all, all out, you know, and, and I just was very much, yes, did, did I want to have my books published? Sure. But, you know, it's interesting that for me, uh, my first books, two books were published while, while I was in the hospital. And while I had want years, I wanted that to uh, happen. It was so important to me. Well, when I was sitting in the hospital, I was happy that they were published, but it wasn't so important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah it, it didn't, you know, what mattered was waking up tomorrow. And so from that point forward, you know, it had never been about so this is the thing and i think again the spiritual traditions all speak about this in different ways we start out and we're kind of taught um that life is going from here to there but i've learned there is no there you mean on a linear path yeah yeah from here to there okay. whether that's whether that's making a dream happen or working towards something or literally physically going from moving from here to there. There is no there. There's only here. And so life is really about coming from in to out, not from here to there. So to, to look at that process, let's look at, let's look at flowers and flowers. So just imagine, imagine this. A flower starts with a seed buried in the ground, underground, and something in it, some force in it, it starts growing toward light, which it doesn't even know what light is yet because it hasn't even seen it. And it's growing toward a force. It doesn't even know what it is. It breaks ground. It starts to root and shoot. It survives weather, winter, storms. And then finally, when it starts to flower, what does it do? 
a flower, like let's say a tulip, it literally turns itself inside out and that's how you see its beauty. Mm. And it does all of that without ever going anywhere. Yeah. Nature at its best. Yeah. And we at our best. As you said, with the with the erosion of a, of a revelation. Yeah, um, I, I I was thinking because I heard an interview discussing your relationship with your father, and I myself, uh, if I recall my childhood and my desire to go to my grandmother's house to seek uh, seek comfort and and um, stability, it was easier for me to go to my grandmother and first of all, initially put up with eating food and then seeing, you know, pictures from the thirties, which eventually became my passion as I, as I got older. And I, and I remember I heard one of the interviews as you spoke about feeding your father on his deathbed. Um, and it moved me and it shook me because as I look now on the relationship that I had with my father, and when a person reaches a certain age there's a point or something just changes or ticks and says, well, now he's older. And all the animosity and all the anger and all the stuff, the transgressions that, 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 that took place, I don't know where it goes or what takes place. Maybe it's just a natural, a natural process. And I look at my father now uh, as more feeble than he was and his dominance or uh, dominance with me is, is, is gone. And yeah. so, I, so I, look at, I look at it and I say to myself, is this a natural progression? And what are we learning from this whole process of, 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 of dealing with our parents in a, in a reversed role, so to speak? Yeah. Maybe you could touch on that a little bit. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, that was, I'm very grateful that, you know, my father and I, as you know, from my, my work, we, we were estranged for many years and like my mother, which my mother and I never really repaired, but my father and I just in the last few years of his life were able to reconnect and really have a closeness, which I'm very grateful for. And, um, and I think that there's this, there is this natural process, you know, I'm, I, I'm working on a memoir about my relationship with my father, our life. And, uh, but at the opening line, the opening line that I, as I've been reflecting on all this is, is um, that uh, having parents is being born to gods who crumble year by year into human beings. Ooh, wow. <laughs> That's great. That's Thank really you. Great. And right, because of course they're gods. We right. literally come from their bodies. They're like Zeus and, you know, like and, and Athena. They're like, you know, and then, yeah, and then we find they're human, you know, and then we learn that, you know, they get angry and they break things and that they can hurt you and they can and you know and and when we're young those are enormous trespasses and yes and not not that they're not real they are real but yeah i i you know um i um even now after he's gone i you know i feel very much i mean even i did you know i i my mother who like i said i had a very difficult for my whole life and when he my father was finally you know in the hospital at the end of his life i went to see him and then i had to see her uh, it was the first time i saw her after 17 years wow. and of course as like you said i walked in the hospital room and she's at the foot of the bed and there's this little old woman and this frail little old woman not that everything that had happened between us wasn't real, wasn't huge, wasn't big. We still had all of our problems, but you know, in my mind or in my heart, she was huge. She was this forbidding huge presence. There's this tiny little woman who still, you know, she still was who she was. She still had her inability to listen. She still had her harshness and uh, insensitivity, but you know, she went from this, uh, uh, I had this image of, she went from this all encompassing, really powerful 
figure to being like this, like, you know, if you chew on a piece of fish and you hit a bone and it was like, oh, wait a minute, what's the, what's this thing? And yeah, yeah. So I think it is a natural process. And of course, the parts of them that live in us. What, that, what, what, what's the, what's the part? What's the part that keeps people away from repairing or attempting to repair a, such a strong bond as a parent-child relationship? Well, I think I can only speak for myself. And I would say, you know, I would say that, um, uh, you know, the, for many years, it was very, it kept me away is that it wasn't emotionally safe to be in, in their presence, they were they were very hurtful, and they were very uh, not acknowledging of uh, of me in any way. And I, I later came to figure out that you know there was a kind of a thing going on there where my parents really taught me that I could do anything and be anything if I just you know gave my all, you know. Perfection. And I. I and I believe them. Yeah, yeah. But I learned part of their being human is I learned as I got older, while they told me that, I don't think they believed it in terms of their own lives. Right, right. So as I started to be all I could be, especially for my mother, it threatened her. It threatened her. She'd already made agreements with herself that she couldn't do that. So now I come home and it's either forcing her to knock me down or change her worldview. Mm. Right. So we never, I've learned since then. So, you know, I, of course, like any child, I would want to come home and try harder and say, but don't you see, look at how hard I've tried. Look at what I'm trying to do. Look, and, and the more I would try, the more it would be slapped down by her. What, what role did your poetry play in your forms of expression through this, this, this period in your life? Well, the poetry was the way that I was able to, to affirm my, myself and my place in the world. Not in the world, the extra, but in the world that, you know, my place as a soul, as a fish in that river. Right. Would, you, would you say that, I, I mean, from reading your poetry and from reading poetry in general, Without making it personal, it almost becomes a neutral narrative, but with such power that almost it, 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 can, it can encompass everyone's soul. And I think that's what your, your words do. They hit, they hit oh, such a you. The, the metaphors, through metaphors, the imagery, and through the, the tactile feeling of it, it's, it's inspiring. And, and, I, and, I, and I know that the suffering and the expression probably honed in from the lack of being probably validated with such a yeah and, and like that's what i mean like i wouldn't do anything different because that was part of what shaped me into who i am so in essence we're just being shaped well we we are being shaped we if are we being, allow it if we allow it yeah if we resist it uh we increase our suffering did you did you resist yourself suffer? Did you increase your resistance during the time when you were getting sick? No, I don't think. I, I mean, only by until I started uh, letting the fear go through. You know, only when I was afraid of everything was I uh, to such an extreme degree was I increasing my suffering. And then you know, from from there, um, I was just you know getting through it. Let's just let's talk about the last thing is authenticity. In terms of how our authentic selves help us on this path in life. Well, I feel that um, be, being authentic, and let's go back. The word authentic comes from the Greek, authentes, and it means the mark of the hands. Okay. So being authentic is an expression of real integrity, like what starts in the heart comes out of the hands. 
You, we are, you know, we do what we say. We, if we care, we, you know, and this is what, what I feel that being authentic is like we, we learn to open our eyes in order to see. Okay. If you don't see when you open your eyes, what's the point of opening your eyes? And we, we learn to open our heart in order to love. If we don't love once our heart is open, then what's the, why did we open our heart in the first place? So authentic has to do authenticity. And then in our own lives, I feel um, just unto ourselves, I feel that the life of our feelings is the language of how the soul, uh, how we find our place as a soul in the world. And so when we can really accept our full humanity, that leads us to experiences of oneness. And it's our authenticity that makes that possible. If we resist it, um, we become more isolated. We lose our, you know, this, and, and that goes with ourselves and with others, you know, the word kindness and the word kinship have the same root, kin. Kinda. Yeah, and if we, if we uh, so one of the rewards for kindness certainly is if it's between people, it strengthens our relationship. But a reward for kindness also is that we experience our kinship with all things when we're kind. The, the, your, your most recent book, uh, The Book of the Soul, The 52 Paths to, li <clears throat> to Living What Matters, just fill in the audience a little bit about that. You wrote that in, I think, June of 2020? Yeah, yeah, that came out last year. And I, you know, of course, I didn't know it was going to come out at that time or finish it then. Um, but, you know, that, that's a book that really explores a lot of what we're talking about after all these years. Um, and I offered 52 paths, not as a sequence, but like the way you throw seeds out in a garden, you don't know which ones are gonna come up and which ones won't. Right. So we wanna offer as many as possible. And so I tried to do it so that there would be one a week because I always invite my readers to take their time reading my books. So like read a chapter, live, live a little. <laughs> Right. Come back and read another chapter, live your life, so that there's a conversation between your inner life and your outer life, um, and take your time so that you could read that over a year. You, uh, you have, a, you have a, a webinar coming up this June. Um, yes. Maybe you could just fill, fill, fill me in on uh, what it is. Sure. What it so the, the webinar, and what I'm, that's online, and I'm, what I do is offer three sessions over three weeks, three Sundays in a row, June 13th, 20 and 27 is this one, hour and a half each session, but it's all around the theme, uh, the life of expression, finding your voice. And because I feel that as we've been talking, you know, that, and here's one more metaphor that, you know, while we're talking, we have to breathe. We have to inhale and exhale. We, we couldn't have said an hour ago, well, we'll just, we'll just exhale today, <laughs> right, right? Right, right? Well, the heart breathes. It has to inhale and exhale too. And the way the heart breathes is by feeling and perceiving. It inhales and it exhales by expressing. And every person, whether you create art or not, has to have a personal form of expression so your heart can breathe. So your heart can breathe. So this, this webinar is going to explore all that uh, more deeply. And people can uh, find out and register at live.marknepo.com. I'll put all that information down on the- uh, Oh, thanks, at, thanks. At your website and all your books and all your information, definitely. And I'll probably be attending myself. Oh, wonderful, thanks. Yeah, I'm definitely, definitely interested. Uh, just I'd like to thank you so much for your inspiring wisdom. Um, your insight and your uh, humanity um, and the ability for you to suffer, but then share your own uh, story and pain and motivate others to look within and also challenge their innermost uh, weaknesses and uh, deficits. So, oh, well, th thank you so much. 
It's great, great to be with you. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, it was so excellent much. to speak to you, Mark. And uh, hopefully, we'll be able to speak again in the future. And I wish you all the luck. And uh, thank you very much. Oh, and I wish you well too. I wish you well too. So be well, and we'll keep in touch. Okay, Mark. Let me just take care. All right. Bye bye. <laughs>